Okay. So my first question is, how and when did you discover your passion for exploring the unknown? And can you tell us about the moment where you were like, this is it, this is what I want to do in the future? Oh, wow. Very good question. Uh, to be honest, I mean, I think I always had that that urge inside me to want to explore. I think that there's a little bit of an explorer in all of us, uh, that there's just something in human nature that makes us attracted to the unknown. Uh, from the earliest age, you know, when we're children, uh, we like to push the boundaries and explore our backyards or, you know, somewhere we haven't been before. And as an adult, I feel like I still have that child childlike instinct to want to go places I haven't been and explore forests or mountains or rivers and lakes um, that I've never been to before. I just try to remember what it felt like to be a five-year-old or a six-year-old. And at that age, you know, the whole world seems magical, uh, so full of wonder. It's so much. So if you've ever seen a young child, you know, when they see it, an animal for the first time, it could be something very ordinary, like a squirrel or just a, a bird. Uh, they get so excited. And I try to remember that feeling. Yeah. And I get a little bit of that that joy uh, when I'm out on one of my adventures or expeditions in a landscape I haven't been to before. So I'd say I was very young. And uh, when I first fell in love uh, with the great outdoors and the natural world and the wilderness, but uh, it wasn't until I was a little bit older that I really figured out how to make a career out of that. And when I was a teenager is when I really started to think, okay, you know, this is what I love now. How do I turn my passion into my career? So I started to plan uh, really when I was still in high school about how I wanted to make this my life. So good question. Thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess we feel that too. For example, me, I really enjoy zoos and uh, I, I get really excited when I see the new animals there. Yeah. So I uh, found out that soon you will participate in an event where adventure will merge with music, an evening of adventure stories and songs, where we'll have Ian Tamblin, folk music singer and uh, songwriter, as uh, your partner. Two artists, a writer and a musician, uh, both passionate about adventure. Does your inspiration for the event come from your connection with nature? Oh, yes, absolutely. So that's... Uh... Yeah, that's going to happen in a few months here in Canada. I'll be on stage and uh, I'll be telling stories from my adventures and sharing some photos uh, from my most recent big journey, which was a journey from southern Canada to the Arctic. And Ian will be on stage uh, playing music. Uh, so we hope that it'll be a fun evening for everyone. Uh, that's part of the uh, my new book. I'm doing a bit of a book tour when my new book comes out. So I'll be visiting different places across Canada and uh, sharing the stories in my book with audiences. That one will be a little bit uh, special because, yeah, as you mentioned, we'll have uh, music as well. Uh, so hopefully that'll make it even more fun for the audience, but thank you. So some little kid already asked this, what was your favorite adventure? But I have another question. What was the most shocking thing you found in it? Okay, wow. Uh, my favorite adventure, I mean, it's hard to choose because I've had many great adventures that I've really enjoyed. But if I had to just pick one, uh, it's tough, but maybe I would say my journey alone across Canada's Arctic. That was my longest journey. Uh, it was in some ways my hardest and most challenging, but also the most rewarding, which is often the case when we undertake uh, difficult tasks, whatever they are. Um, if you get through them, sometimes the rewards uh, we're totally worth it. So that would probably be my favorite. Uh, the most shocking thing that I found, hmm, there are many, but uh, let me think something. Does it have to be from that expedition or could it be from any adventure? It can be from any. Any adventure. Well, you know, I love trees. I love trees. And uh, this is probably going to surprise oh. you because you, you think maybe he's going to talk about a waterfall or some rare type of bird. But um, I'd actually have to say it was a tree I found once. Um, it's a tree that's very rare nowadays because they tragically were killed off almost 100 years ago uh, by a disease that was introduced into Canada and the United States. The, the tree is called an American chestnut. Uh, you can look it up online. And if you went back in time 200 years ago, uh, it was one of the most magnificent trees in all of the forest in Canada. It was this huge, beautiful tree. And they got to, you know, they were absolutely giant trees. And then in the 1930s, um, most of them died off uh, because of an invasive blight 
that was accidentally introduced. And now they're very, very rare. Uh, you can wander for weeks and months in the forest and never come across a single one. And uh, if you find one, they're usually just little trees and they die uh, before they get uh, mature. So it's very, very rare to ever find one. And a few years ago, I was in the forest and I was walking through the forest and I was looking at the ground and all of a sudden I saw a chestnut and I recognized it. I knew this was not the European chestnut, which has been introduced to Canada. It's not native here, but we've had it planted and it grows all over the place. But this was the real thing. Uh, this was the actual native American chestnut. And I looked up with astonishment and I saw in front of me this big giant tree. And I knew I was looking at the rarest of all trees in Canada that I had found against all odds, uh, this super rare endangered American chestnut that had, had survived and grown to, into a giant. And I got so excited to see it. Um, it almost brought tears to my eyes. So I would say maybe that was my most shocking an unexpected uh, discovery on all my adventures, finding this rare tree. So that was really exciting for me. But thank you. A good question. Um, I know that you've been all around Canada, as you've seen the videos uh, and in your speech. But uh, have you considered going on an expedition in the Arctic Ocean in itself without a canoe uh, with a larger ship and uh, maybe a larger crew? uh have i considered it well it's i mean everything crosses your mind from one time or another if you're just uh, daydreaming but in terms of actually planning an expedition into the arctic ocean with a ship that would be pretty difficult um I, you know most of my my expertise is in small boats little canoes i wouldn't really know how to sail a big ship uh, especially through the arctic so maybe i could join someone else's expedition just as a member of the crew uh, but as in terms of organizing it and leading it myself uh, I don't think that's probably going to be something that I would do, but who knows? I mean, the future is unwritten. Anything is possible. So I can't say no either. Anything is possible. But thank you. And from which adventure have you learned the most about yourself and about the things around you? Wow. Which adventure have I learned the most from? Maybe the one I did just last year. Uh, this was a quite different adventure for me. It's when I, I call it Where the Falcon Flies. That's the title of my new book because it uh, was inspired by the, the flight of, of peregrine falcons, a beautiful bird. You have them in Europe too. And uh, in Canada, these birds will migrate every year from Southern Canada to the Arctic. They'll migrate thousands of kilometers. They fly to the Arctic and they make nests there, usually on cliffs. They'll lay their eggs. Um, when the little ones have grown up, by the end of the summer, they'll migrate all the way south again. And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't it be neat uh, to follow the falcons on their journey? And uh, that's what I did in my canoe. I followed them for about 3,400 kilometers from the most southern part of Canada, right near the, the American border, um, all the way north to the Arctic. And this journey to me uh, was very different than anyone I'd done before. And I learned a lot along the way because... In order to get all the way to the north, I had to travel through big cities in my canoe, cities like Toronto and Montreal. So these are cities that are home to you know millions of people, apartments and busy highways and roads. And uh, this was different for me because I wasn't used to that. I was used to traveling in the wilderness where I don't see anyone at all. So I had to canoe uh, for well over a month to get to the far north out into the wild. And during that first month, I crossed paths with hundreds of different people uh, from all walks of life, from all over the world. Uh, and what I found is that everyone I met with uh, was uh, showed me nothing but kindness and enthusiasm. They were all so eager to help me, even when they didn't know who I am or even where I was going. Um, they just randomly crossed my path. You know, people would offer me food. They'd offer me water, sometimes a place to put up my tent for the night. You know, you can come camp and in my neighborhood or in my backyard or sometimes helping me if there was a fence because then again i'm not i'm traveling in in civilization so sometimes there'd be a fence with barbed wire and it's like oh how am i going to get over this sometimes people would say oh I'll, I'll help you i'll help lift your canoe over it uh, or give me directions like well if you go that way there's a road um, but there's a place you can get across uh, so that to me was a, a really surprising and, and uh, rewarding aspect of this journey was just seeing uh, the good and in strangers and how, you know, most people are, are only too happy to help um, a stranger. So I really like that. 
uh, that was a very rewarding part of my journey. Thank you. Good question. I mean, uh, Canada, uh, Canada's residents are known for uh, being really kind worldwide. That's uh, the stereotype. And uh, in this case, it's a good and real stereotype as we have seen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I suppose I suppose that's true. Um, uh, that's good. I didn't know if that was still the stereotype in uh, all of the world in Romania, but it's good that uh, that still is. So yeah, I think I think it's true that people all over the world. I mean, we often think, uh, you know, what are they going to be like? But um, when you meet strangers, in my experience, from all over the world, most people are in their heart uh, good and kind and and willing to help you when you're in need. So yeah, great. Thank you. Um. And uh, I wonder, have you ever went on a trip? Uh, I know that you're an expert in canoes and uh, such smaller boats. But have you ever went without a canoe? And uh, if so, have you ever went uh, actually skiing? Because there are uh, there is a lot of snow in uh, the upper parts of Canada. Yes, that's a good question. Yeah, so I do uh, in the winter when it's too cold to canoe, I'll do other expeditions on foot. Normally that's with snowshoes, but sometimes with skis, uh, sometimes I've cross country skied and that can be a lot of fun. That can be a very effective way uh, to cover a lot of kilometers quickly. Um, so sometimes I do expeditions on cross country skis or just hiking. Sometimes if I'm in the mountains, I don't really want to canoe because I'm there aren't really rivers that I can canoe anyways. So I'm just hiking in the mountains or climbing. And uh, snowshoeing as well. It depends on the conditions. Sometimes the snow is too deep uh, for the skis, and then the snowshoes have the advantage spreading out. Other times, it's really it's more like climbing. You have to climb up a mountain, and the snowshoes can help you do that because they have uh, ice crampons underneath to dig into the ice and let you climb. But other times, the skis are better, especially if you're going across like a frozen lake or a frozen river. Then you can really travel fast if you have skis. Uh, so, yep, I use all different methods of travel. Uh, on my adventures, not just canoes. My canoes are probably my my favorite way to travel, but uh, I use all different ways to get out on the land and experience it. So thank you. Good question. My last question is, we know that you have done many journeys alone, for example, the journey alone across Canada's, Canada's Arctic, but were there any moments when you thought that you couldn't continue your journey and how did you get over them? Ah, well, good question. Hmm. You know, uh, on my adventures, uh, I often face uh, difficult moments that can be disheartening, especially when the weather goes against you. You're facing storms or very powerful winds or it's been raining for three weeks straight or it's it's very cold. It's snowing in July. Uh, all those things have happened to me. Uh, and it, it, can be, it can be easy to say, oh, no, I can't go on or it's too difficult or I need to quit. Uh, but I just try to remind myself, um, well, one, that I'm very lucky to get to do what I love and that this is the kind of thing I dreamed about as a child. So I should make the most of it uh, while I still can that, I, you know, I'm young enough to still be able to do these adventures. So that usually motivates me. And I also remind myself of, yeah, my my socks are, are wet and I'm freezing cold and I'm numb in the canoe. But just think of how good it will be if I push on, I don't quit and I paddle hard. And then at the end of the day. I can have a campfire and the warmth of that fire is going to feel uh, like the top of the world, the best feeling in the world. I'm going to have a nice tent and I can put my sleeping bag in there, have a cup of tea, eat something, you know, taste like the best meal I ever had in my life. So those those experiences can be so rewarding um, that it's like new wind in my sails or a new spring in my step and it'll motivate me to keep going uh, no matter what. So absolutely, I face difficult moments when I've had my doubts, but most of the time, I'm able to tell myself, don't give in, uh, don't quit, keep going. And uh, when you do that, keep putting one step in front of the, of the other and sort of take it one step at a time. Uh, usually that gives me the inspiration I need to keep going. So, yeah, that's usually how it goes. Thank you. So I think that uh, we have said uh, our questions, but uh, if uh, you want, uh, I uh, thought of giving you like uh, four uh, places you can uh, visit in Romania if you like, because I think that uh, you'd uh, really enjoy them. Uh, Absolutely. I want to hear them. You're going to make me want to book a flight right now to Romania. <laughs> so first is um, the Piatra Craiului Mountains, which uh, are... Uh, some famous mountains in our country because uh, it is a very popular place to go uh, hiking and climbing. 
and uh, we ourselves have got a classmate who does that mostly weekly. Uh, okay. Next is the Sarmisegetus archaeological site, um, because uh, uh, there's uh, the Toronto Magazine, I think it was, or something uh, said that uh, you are Canada's Indiana Jones. I think you'd enjoy uh, uh, seeing the diggings at uh, that place. Because Absolutely. I'd love to visit archaeological site. Uh, the third one is uh, the Danube Delta, uh, where uh, there you can go um, if... I, I'm not sure if you can go with the canoe to, uh, in some places the water is a bit shallow, but in some it is deep. But uh, other than the temperatures being low, they are pretty much like the rivers in Can Canada. And uh, at last, uh, Yash City, which is our city, in which um, you'd be welcome to come visit and uh, maybe even our school. Excellent. Well, those uh, I'll note all four of those down in my my journal as places on my list to visit. So you're doing a very good job uh, promoting Romania. I would love to visit one day. So the forest, the mountains, the delta, your school, the archaeological sites, they all sound uh, very exciting to me. I'd love to come visit. Thank you. Thank you for letting us interview you. Goodbye. Uh, my pleasure. Anytime. Thank you.